Okay, Mitch. Here. Thanks for watching. Remember to like, share, and subscribe. Whatever YouTube people say. Give me more. Give me. Give me more energy. Nope. I don't have that. Say okay. smash. Smash that like button. <laughs> no. <laughs> no. Cause is lost. Hey, do you want to make another one of your flag poles? <coughs> I'll, I'll get the 13 stars and bars. Oh, yeah. I'll make another one. Everybody knows what that means. That's like flying the Gadsden. I don't know what the 13 stars and bars are. The original flag? The 13 stars and bars? Oh. The original flag? Betsy Ross flag, okay. if you will. Yes, I know what that <laughs> You never heard the 13 stars and bars before? <laughs> yeah, if you hear somebody say 13 stars and bars, they're talking about the Betsy Ross flag. Now you know. And knowing is half the battle. The other half is extreme violence. Well, one of the oh. things, one of the things that um, Ezra Jeff Benson said in that talk that I was telling you about, it was once, once liberty is lost, only human blood can gain it again. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's uh it's true. So we want to have an official start, um, start. Did you bring a cup? Yep. What are you drinking? Chai. Chai? Tea. Oh my goodness, I haven't had chai since I was in Ramadi. That was a long time ago. It's just herbal tea. I know what chai is, Fred. Well, it's called different things in different places. In Romania, it's just herbal tea. I don't oh. know what it is elsewhere. Well, pin a rose on your nose. Ain't you fancy? Let me lift my pinky while I keep this. <laughs> there we go. I could do that too. <laughs> that just feels gay. Yeah. <laughs> Especially here with you. <laughs> um. <laughs> What were we talking about? Episode 10. No, 11. 11. Episode 11. 11. Um, no, uh, we can kind of talk about what you just talked about in the in Ezra Taft Benson's talk about when liberty's gone, only blood can restore it. Um, uh, and that's true, but um, I think one thing that we failed to realize, and I've I've talked about it a few times um, through this, uh, if freedom dies here, then it dies for the rest of the world. You know, nobody else has the rights and privileges and protections that we have, and it's important to acknowledge that. And uh, that's that's how important it is. It could disappear from the face of the earth for it. Well, not forever, but for who knows how many generations if we fail. And that's that's a heavy weight. So much of our freedom is being lost because we're conforming to what we're being told. Mm -hmm. It's straight up. You'll have the governor say, "You have to do this. You have to wear a mask. You have to do this, or else we'll find you. We'll, you'll be penalized." And it, masks is just our the, the current thing right now. But it's been going on for for generations, where the government basically is testing how much they can tell you to do and how much you'll follow them until you stop following them. And if you keep following them and you keep following them then compliance is permission yeah you're you're allowing them to take your freedom and then when you when it comes time to fight back it's 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 like chaining someone up but instead of using these shackles you're using one strand of lace at a time just lay a strand of lace on them just lay a strand of lace just lay a strand of lace before too long they can't they can't move simply because they're tied up with lace and it's oh but we're being safe we're being protected we're being uh, for the good of everybody and so we lay down our freedoms just because we're it's taking the goodness in us that we want things to be good for others 
and giving up our freedoms for that, which is not good. It's it's actual it's it's evil. It's Your tyranny. compassion's being weaponized against you. Yes, that's in Bill Ayers's um, lessons for a book. His book, Lessons for a Radical, or something like that. But he, he says use the use the virtues of your of your enemy against them, and that's your your desire to be good to others is being used against you, and you got to realize that. That's why Christ said, "Be wise as serpent, but innocent as doves." I guess it's a good thing that I don't have any values. <laughs> no, um, and with the with the governor's mandates of you can't get together with anybody outside of your household and the organizer will be charged a fine of $10,000 and um, threats of imprisonment for not wearing a mask. He just, he doesn't have the authority to just unilaterally do that. We have three separate distinct branches of government for a reason. You have the legislative, which legislates, you have the executive that executes, and then you have the judicial that adjudicates. And they're three separate powers for a reason. Um, you can't have one do the job of the other, nor should you, because that, that sets a dangerous precedent. Uh, and, it's, and it's just like this. You're leaving the, the governor to be the judge, jury, and executioner for something that really is irrelevant it doesn't matter um now the vi you know the virus is a real thing people get sick but you know it's the government's job to protect our rights it's our job to protect our health and when you start surrendering your rights to be kept safe you lose both if, and deserve neither according if, to benjamin franklin yeah if you really think that the the government's job is to make sure people stay safe Look at the, according to our beloved CDC, the, um, the all benevolent, all benevolent CDC. Yeah, uh, there are what was it, four hundred and eighty thousand people who die from cigarette smoke every year, and twenty thousand of those are just secondhand. But the government has never banned cigarette smoke. That's that's half a million people almost die every year from that. How many people have died from coronavirus? Even with their pumped up numbers, it's, I, I yeah. don't know, I don't know off the top of my head, but it's just, it's, 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 it's silliness. It, well, it's, it's been like 400 or 600 something here. Yeah, in, in all of Utah. Yeah. It's, it's all about how much will the people let me tell them what to do. And you notice this with kids, you, you have kids that are, um, ooh. Ooh. <laughs> you have you when you're if anybody who's like taught kids and stuff like that you know sometimes you're going to run into that kid who's just a uh Be free. not wanting to listen and you know the harder you push him the more he's going to fight back against you so you're very careful with the, the the rules that you give to him hey that's me yeah exactly <laughs> you, if you give a rule that he doesn't find a reason for that he doesn't see that oh that's actually a good idea he's going to fight against it that's what the government's been trying to do with us is okay what can what rules can we give that they're not going to fight against what rules can we give that they're going to concede simply because of the um the attrition the the, the difficulty in fighting back against it and it's always been the effect that if you want to make a people a slave make or if you want to control a population make everyone a criminal and then prosecute uh what is the word uh, when you decide uh, liberally prosecute liberally where where if everybody's a criminal if everybody breaks the law, then you can just punish the ones that you want to silence or punish the ones that are causing problems. And everybody else is like, oh, I don't want that to happen to me because they're criminals as well because the laws are so um, corrupt. They're so wrong. But that's also me. <laughs> yep. I was going to say something, but I forgot what it was. Um, a... If you have a moral and a just law, it shouldn't take any, you know, any convincing to do. But, I mean, with all this stuff that they keep pushing and keep saying, it just takes some of us and pushes us further and further and makes us want to fight harder and harder. 
that's the type of person that I am. The more you try to convince me of something, the harder I'm going to push back against it. Just that's the way I've always been. I'm I'm pretty defiant. <laughs> and I'm I'm never I've never been one that like I I like to consider myself free thinking. Everybody does. Everyone wants to think of themselves as free thinking. So that's kind of a trope. But I do like to try and think out things for myself. And I've never tried to be belligerent or be. I'm not that. I'm not that. That same type of a character. But you're not me. I'm not you. No. <laughs> but I've turned into the bad guy because when I go to the store, I don't wear a mask. People would look at me like. And and some people. I, I I had the other day. I think I mentioned it where a lady um, at a Sam's Club. She was like, they were asking me if I had a mask. I was like, no, I don't have a mask. And he's like, oh, is it? He was trying to make excuses for why I could go without a mask, and I felt bad for him. But the lady in front of me that was a customer, and she had a mask on, and she was like, you don't have to wear a mask. You be you. Good for you. <laughs> and I was like, thank you, ma'am. You know, and it's just, there are people who see what's going on, and it's masks right now are just a, they're the current way of trying to weed people out and point out who is going to conform. Who are the not. dissenters? Yeah, who's the dissenter? And... If everybody continues to, to conform, then then the, the message to the, the ruling class that they view themselves as the elite is, okay, what's the next thing? Where's our next lever? Where's our next pin? Where's the next thing that we can make them do? Yeah, because if, if you notice, the longer this goes along and the more, you know, the more serious they make their threats, the more people comply. Whereas if we all just didn't, then they'd be like, well, they're not listening to us. And that's what Governor Herbert said oh, the last time he was trying to get everybody to freak, about, freak out about the numbers and everything. He said, it's almost like people aren't listening to us. Well, Gary, that's because people aren't listening to you. You don't matter that much. <laughs> I don't care about your opinion. I don't yeah. care about how important you think you are. And that's because we're America. <laughs> that's we don't have a king. We don't have a, a ruling class that is meant to be telling us how to live. We're it's we're not we don't have a feudal lord that we that we are loyal to. Yeah. We want to be left alone. <laughs> Which who would have ever thought that that would be such an extreme line of thinking? Oh. I never would have thought that wanting to be left alone to make my own choices and live my own life would be extreme. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way that people are treating it. But you don't want to, you don't want to, you know, follow the herd. You're dangerous. Something, and that's another thing. They, um, I, I saw a study, it's been a month or so ago. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I saw a study um, a little while ago it's been a month a couple months probably but uh, what they were saying was um, people people who refuse to wear masks are um, sociopaths hmm. or have sociopathic tendencies which everybody has sociopathic tendencies everybody has psychopathic tendencies i mean that's just human nature but the way that they were saying is they're demonizing the people who refuse to uh to comply and that's what they do with everything oh you don't want to you don't want to follow the herd there's something wrong with you you bet, must be crazy i bet the amish don't wear masks <laughs> did you see the amish trump train no, oh, I think it did, I think it did. Dude, the Amish have, they're, they've got some things going for them. Yeah, the Amish are awesome. I know. They really, they really don't give a shit. No, they don't. <laughs> and that's, you know, a lot of people say that that's not a, a virtue, but I think it is. Oh, yeah. Look at the because communities. Because if, if you they don't give them. a shit, who controls you? They're, they fear God. That's, yeah. that's who they fear. And, and that's who we should that. fear. I respect the, the hell out of that. Yeah, uh, but that's just the thing. Uh, they make it look like it's not a virtue when not caring really is. Well, 
depending on the circumstance, but it's 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 not about not caring. It's about fearing God before you fear man. It's about being free. Yeah. Be free. I the Lord God make you free. Imagine how like it's so much fun to to be to, to be free though. It's so much fun to think <laughs> for yourself. Imagine the people that they they have to um, play the mental gymnastics of, oh, you have to have the masks, and then oh, but we can celebrate uh, Biden win, but oh, no, you need the masks, <laughs> but oh, we can we can um, we can get together for Black Lives Matter rallies. Like that, those mental gymnastics is like, oh, we need a social distance, but let's go for this march, and oh, we need to do this, you know? It's like that's got to be hell. It's like rules for me, but not for thee. Well, it's 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 just it's just takes us back to that primal chaotic lifestyle where you're like you have nothing stabil stable in your life and your your so much of your happiness is depend on is dependent on the political cycle or the news cycle or the, the scientific m journal who who gives I got <laughs> wait a minute <laughs> that nobody cares about <laughs> but did you derail <laughs> no, I kind of did. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna say, who gives a shit about? But it's just like, the, 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 so much of their happiness is dependent on not them. So much of their happiness is dependent on other factors that they have no control over, and so they can't. They're they're it, they're giant toddlers, and it's just that's gotta be that sucks, you know? Exhausting. It's exhausting. Oh man. That's it, <laughs> yeah. That's that's why I don't. That's. A very liberating thing about just being yourself being you not caring about conforming and you know doing what's socially acceptable it's very liberating to just be yourself yeah you know I I don't wear a mask I the only times I've worn a mask uh, all year has been when I've gone to the hospital when there's there's the other thing about about the mandates and everything you have the governor telling me who I can and cannot have in my house he doesn't pay my mortgage he doesn't pay my power bill my gas you know he doesn't pay any of those bills he pays no bills that are associated with with my home so who the hell does he think he is that he can come in and say you can and cannot do this in your house you we have to realize how dangerous how dangerous that precedent is because your house your home is your castle yep so i mean if nothing else that should that should disturb you he's saying what you can and cannot do in your house who you, you can have in there and who you can't and that's just not okay and as far as as far as um what what rights the the mandates um, are infringing on is it's very clearly infringing on the First Amendment saying that I can't you know I can't protest by not wearing a mask um, if you have a religion that says that you can't wear a mask you're violating that and I would argue that that you know it's against our religion to be forced to because we don't we don't believe in in force we believe in agency to make that own choice so i would argue that but that's neither here nor there um it also violates the fourth amendment especially if you have to show proof of a vaccination to go somewhere because the people the right of the people to be sure, secure in their possessions the fifth amendment and the 14th amendment saying nobody can be deprived of the right to life liberty or property without due process of law and if you think that you're going to have a fair trial in their kangaroo court over this you're sadly mistaken um it also the fines and stuff violate the eighth amendment the eighth amendment talks about excessive fines and i'll find that really quick and read that one because most people are not familiar 
10, 11, 7, 8. Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. That is a gross violation of the Eighth Amendment. $10,000 for me to hang out with my friends or do whatever I want? I don't think so. Pound sand and shove it up your ass, Gary. I hope you watch this. You know who I am. <laughs> <laughs> But, so, I mean, be free. That's the way that God intended it. I, I mean, it's talked about all throughout the scriptures about the importance of, of freedom to him to be able to make our own choices. To be able to live the gospel, you have to be free to make choices. Christ's plan was agency. I'll go down, the glory will, will still be yours, and we'll grant people the opportunity to make mistakes. Satan's plan is, no, everybody's going to do what they're damn told and be happy about it. I'll get the glory. Yeah. And that war, we've said it before, it's going on today. It's, you can't say it much more profoundly than that because we really do have this, this point in front of us where... We have to allow ourselves to be influenced from, from one side or the other. And the government is trying to make sure that we're not. The government is trying to make sure that we don't have that opportunity to make a choice. And that's why that's why there's something... I, I think a lot of people have this gut feeling that something's wrong, but they don't know how to, to put it in words. The thing that's wrong is that your people are trying to make it so you have no choices. People are trying to turn you into grown-up toddlers. This that's, is, that's not you. That's not what you're meant to be. This is what happens when we don't send right, wise and righteous men to represent us. Yeah, the, the people mourn. I mean, you don't have to be of my same religion to be a righteous man. Um, and that's not the point, but you have to be a good and, and righteous man. Um, I already have this book by Brian Meek and Lessons on Liberty. You can find it on Amazon or the LES Conservatives, I, I believe you can find it on. This is a gold mine. Um, if you don't have it, I recommend finding it and reading it. But, I mean, for an example, uh, I will show you what we should be looking for if I can find it. Say something while... Well, well, I'm looking. <laughs> John Taylor said, this is just from page three, he says, John Taylor said, besides the preaching of the gospel, we have another mission, namely the perpetuation of the free, the perpetuation of free agency of man and the maintenance of liberty, freedom, and the rights of man. It's not, it's, it's, we, we as a church, we do believe in, um, in preaching the gospel and sharing that Christ has restored his gospel on the earth. But that's not just it. We also have a responsibility and a duty to preserve the Constitution, to preserve the freedom of man. That we, we, um, we claim that this land is a land that's meant to do that, that God has ordained for that freedom. As you just said, man, I'm getting really good at turning right where I need to go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Alma chapter 60 and we've talked about this before a lot just to you know really drive the point home um, verse 29 behold it is time yea the time is now at hand that except ye do bestir yourselves in the defense of your country and your little ones the sword of justice doth hang over you, yea, and it shall fall upon you and visit you even to your utter destruction. That, like we said before, that is as much to us as it is to Pahorn. But what I wanted to share, I found it. <laughs> it's an excerpt from Ezra Taft Benson's Proper Role of Government. Unlike the political opportunists, the true statesman values principle over popularity. 
and works to create popularity for those political principles which are wise and just. Wise and just. One of the things that he said there was how it's not it's not the it's not people going after what's popular. Shit everywhere. It's finding what is pop or it's finding the true principle and then finding ways to make that popular with the people. That's what a true statesman does. Well, and I mean, just in general, doing the right thing typically is not the popular thing. That's why popularity is such a dangerous, well, such a slippery slope. Because in order to feel, to be popular, people will do, I mean, whatever. You know, they'll abandon their principles, they'll do terrible, awful things in order to fit in. Why? Ezra Taft Benson had so much good um, insight into the government and into the Constitution and stuff. And I think a lot of people from my generation don't realize Ezra Taft Benson, while he was a member of the Twelve Apostles, he was called to, or he was, um, what is the right word? He was appointed the head secretary of agriculture for the United States government. He was in, I think it was Ezra, uh, Eisenhower's, yeah, Eisenhower's, uh, I believe so. Yeah, I think it was Eisenhower's, uh, cab cabinet. So, I mean, he's the head of agriculture, the, the part, the Department of Agriculture. Ezra Taft Benson was, was the, the, the head of that while he was a member of the Twelve Apostles. He saw the way that the government worked, he had opportunities to see the, the, um, curtain fall or the Iron Curtain come down in Eastern Germany or in Eastern Europe. He saw the when the United States. Um, and England abandoned Poland. He saw the the effects of communism, and he saw the he saw those uphand. In, he, in in the talk that I was telling you about, he was in Poland in um, in uh, 1946, I think it was, when when basically the the Allies um, abandoned them, if I remember right. And he 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 saw firsthand what happens, and there, there's reasons why he was so passionate about teaching about freedom is because he understood on a very personal level and a lot of people um, say he was extreme for that and that's that's very very erroneous and very wrong he was he was the prophet of God he was he, he had some amazing insights that that are worth reading into well and I want to when it comes to your rights and your freedom you should be extreme there's uh, there's nothing wrong with that it is <coughs> your freedom is everything your freedom is the most precious thing you own I mean we think of our cars as being precious our our fine things our property being precious but really the most precious thing that you own is your freedom because that gives you the the power to ascertain all the other things without freedom what else do you really have and that's why that's why guns and the Second Amendment is so important because that is your that is your keystone to everything else. As long as you have those, you are able to forge your own destiny and you're able to be free. Because if you have the means to fight back, nobody can truly force their will upon you. Yeah, you will, may die. You may lose that fight, but it's better to die on your feet than it is to live on your knees. It is not better red than dead. That's a throwback to the 60s, 70s, and 80s. Better red than dead is what people would say. Better to be a communist than die. Really? Yeah. People are stupid. People are stupid. But, I mean, your freedom is so precious, such a precious thing, and it's proved over and over and over in the scriptures and, and everything, you know, and, I mean, hell, we talked about it a couple of weeks ago in First Nephi chapter 4, he's, the Lord tells <coughs> Nephi specifically that one of the reasons that it's okay for him to kill Laban is he stole your property. It's specifically there. Oh, yeah, and he stole your property, so <laughs> smite him. 
that's one of the things that people get really I mean I've, I've talked about it a bit in a, here and there but it's it's people get confused by the fact that we believe that Christ also teaches us to love and Christ teaches us to to be kind and to be um, to endure all things but we also believe that we have a right to defend ourselves and, and people have a hard time reconciling that but when when you come down to it that we're taught to be come good fathers we're taught to become good good people that 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 has to do with the, the thing that you brought up in that first podcast we did you know there are three types of men there are those who are um, imp- uh, I said impotent and you made fun of me but that's a great way for saying it those who, <laughs> oh yeah I guess that would apply <laughs> yeah those who those who can't impotent. defend themselves those who those who can't defend themselves and they have no option those who who are violent who force their will upon others those who force their will upon others and then those who will those who don't make trouble but don't take none either those who will do violence to preserve good and that that third category of man is is who we are meant to be you're not meant to be cruel you're not meant to be evil you're not meant to wish with uh, bad on others that that is wrong if you if you delight in the in the folly of your enemy then that's a that's a vice of yours you should pray for those who who despitefully use who spitefully use you and abuse you but you don't you don't let Christ gave us tools to find to, to see to see who are sheeps and wolf are wolves and sheep's clothing he gave us tools to see who are those that are um, fake and those who are hypocrites and just listen to his his, his words yeah I, Christ taught us to love and when it comes to when it comes to warfare and to combat and everything you love what you have you love you know you love your family the people that you're fighting with and you know you don't hate your enemy but you know you love what you have and that's why you're doing what you're doing it's out of it's out of love and i've talked about that before you know war is war is terrible and it's awful and you know you it there's just no words to describe it unless you know but um there's also there's also love that you could never understand that you could never see otherwise other than you know in the most desperate of circumstances men laying down their lives for other people then sacrificing everything doing the impossible for you know themselves the innocent civilians who are caught in the middle of all of it and i mean yeah that's christ taught us to love he didn't teach us to hate but he also didn't tell us to just lay down and take it there, there's a difference between showing charity and being taken advantage of and letting yourself be taken advantage of letting yourself be taken advantage of is not charity that's not the same as being charitable there's a, there's a there's a distinct difference there, and you have to you have to realize that. Back to lessons on liberty. <coughs> this is from Ezra Taft Benson's proper role of government. Um, he says, and this is talking about the the government obviously it says it cannot claim the power to redistribute the wealth or force reluctant citizens to perform acts of charity against their will and i've said it a million times and you've said it a million times it's not the government's job to legislate or enforce charity or morality nor should it because and some people think well i think they should well that's dangerous because when they decide that they want to legislate something that you find immoral then it's an issue it's abortion now what's it going to be next really what's it going to be next the elderly (laughs) then it'll be the sick and the weak and the mentally deficient you know the handicapped so i mean oh but that's for the good of society yeah 
Yeah. You can hear people say that. You can hear people in their self-righteous attitudes say that. Trying to justify it. Justify murder. You know, I had a conversation with the pro-choice person. I'm not going to say who it was. And last week and she said you know i'm i'm pro-choice because you know this that or the other reason and she and she said uh you know think of the load it will take off of the foster care system and i said and i said to her I'm like, look you're depriving another individual of life liberty and the pursuit of happiness another individual and she said, well, what about, what about rape and incest? I said, why should an innocent child be held accountable for the sins of their father? You know, just because you get pregnant and have a baby doesn't mean that you have to keep it. I mean, obviously, if, um, if the mother's life is in danger, that's one thing. But, you know trauma is what it is you're going to experience it at some point in your life and if you don't well you're lucky but uh, yeah and i i like to think that she had a little bit of a change of heart that she kind of saw it through a different light and that's what we have to do we have to explain things to people in a in a different way that they can understand that's been <clears throat> kind of hard for me because i don't like to waste time with idiots <laughs> well with idiots but saying things in a different way I just say things up front and succinctly and my dear wife has told me she's like you gotta say it in a way that people will hear it yeah I guess you're right it's one of those things where it's like what you read earlier it's not our job to um go for the popular opinion it's our job to go for the uh, go for the opinion that's moral and then try and make that popular do what's right encourage others to, to see that yeah no doing doing what's right is it's just paramount There's nothing else we can say. There's nothing else we can do. It's you just have to do what's right. Glug 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 glug. <laughs> also, have fun doing it. I think one of the problems with the people who fight for good is they may is we turn it into like a. A holy war which sometimes it needs to be but sometimes just realize that it's a lot more fun to just go have fun and be a good person you can be you can be a lot better person when you're with it's it's just funner to be a, a good person um, and I'm thinking of like things that you can do with neighbors things that you can do that are that where you, when you do good for someone else and you don't get caught and you don't get they, they don't know who did it for them and you just kind of sneakily go around and do good for the people around you that's a blast it's yeah. it's really is you get your kids involved with doing something kind or doing something that helps a family out or something like that and they love it they enjoy it and there's 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 a lot of fun there there's a lesson to be learned as well you know and doing doing the right thing like with charity and stuff like that <laughs> I, it's my opinion that when you go out and you tell everybody, you know, I just donated all this money or all this stuff to this or that. Look at me. I'm such a good person, which is why a lot of people do it. The charity is lost because you're bringing it back to say, hey, look at me. That's Well, that's not just your opinion. That's Christ's opinion. Yeah. He said that cast your alms before uh, don't, not let your left hand see what your right hand sees because if you do, then you've already received your reward. If you do it to be seen of man, there is your reward also. It's like that's 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 the right opinion. <laughs> you know, it's... Well, how how often do we see that people are like, yeah, I just donated and you know all this money to so and so who's in trouble or 
to this group or that group and it's like you really just need that little pat on the back don't you yeah every time that that i donate money i always do it anonymously hell half the time i don't even tell my wife <laughs> i mean because that's just that's what you do you just do it because it needs to be done and not for recognition and it's so much more enjoyable like you you gain a, a so much more peace like enjoy inside your heart when you're like that really helped someone out that really did something good for someone and you're not having to sit there and think about oh did so and so see this am i going to look good to so and so <laughs> did this person did the bishop know that i did that <laughs> god that's that's a that's a bad attitude i don't like glory and attention seekers yeah and the people who do it just do it with everything <laughs> so i mean it's, it's not like it's just that nobody uh and they don't fool anybody about it either. It's like, you're, nobody realize, you, you think that you, you're, you're sly about it. You're like, oh, secretly making it so that people notice without having to be obvious that people are, you're trying to make it so people notice. It's like, you don't fool anybody. Everybody <laughs> sees what you're trying to do. It's like, oh, you, you, don't, don't break your arm, you know? Pat yourself on the back. Some of us can't even reach our own back. <laughs> no, it's just, do the right thing because it's the right thing to do and feel good about it yourself. You're not here for the glory and the opinion of man. You're here to prove that you can do the right thing regardless of who's watching. It's called integrity. <laughs> now it's kind of kind of a core value. But then again, if you don't have it, you don't have it and that will apply in all things. Yeah. <laughs> the other thing I love is people who sit there and say how much they love America and pretend to be all patriotic but then they turn around on the other hand and say well it's okay to force people to do things are you I'm sorry are you an American or are you not you, you can't I've said it time and time again but you can't legislate morality you just can't nor should you attempt to no That's the Lord's job. Well, no, he doesn't legislate it. <laughs> but, I mean, that's not... Yeah, man doesn't make morals. That's why, one, that's why the secular wisdom is always behind, is because it's always man trying to justify what is moral, and trying to, to claim what is moral. But that's not our duty. That's not our that's not our position. It's not our role in life. We don't decide morality. When you have a problem with something that the prophets have said in the past or something that the um, church has done or something like that. Oh, that's yeah, your I love problem. That. <laughs> what? I love that. Uh, well look what the church did. I don't really care. <laughs> that was a hundred years ago. Why do I give a shit? Well, it's, it's, here's the thing, we, no, I don't claim that everybody, every act that the church has done is perfect, I don't claim that the church is perfect, the church is, Christ organized the perfect church, and then he led us into it, and we're not, we're not perfect, we're people, yeah. I follow the prophet because I've prayed and asked God, and I've received an answer for myself, that I need to do that, and that's why I do it, there's, there's no other, um, justification that I can give other than what God has told me through personal revelation and that's that's sufficient for me the Lord speaks to each of us and tells us what we should do and gives us all our personal revelation you know when I when I was 18 getting ready to turn 19 deciding whether I should go on a mission or or volunteer to go to Iraq I felt like I was supposed to go to Iraq that's the that's the inspiration and the revelation that was given to me and so that's what I did and we talked about it before a lot of people didn't accept that as being right no you're supposed to go on a mission and that I think yes missions are important I believe that as a young man 
you should do something but the saying that a mission is the only way to go is the only thing and it, as a determination of righteousness and treating it as if it's a saving ordinance it's not missions are important and I'm not trying to take that away but it's really done a disservice to a lot of men who are young men and young women who are just as faithful and just as obedient as others but received inspiration to not go and not everybody's meant to go on a mission here's here's the thing we need to stop looking at check boxes that we can how we can judge others because when you when you view your your actions when you view the way that people use their agency as a list of okay this person does that so he's a good person this person doesn't do that so they're a bad person this person doesn't do this so they're a good person this person does do this so they're a bad person you know it's we we were if you're focused on how you can judge someone else and determine someone else uh, their their worth then you're kind of focused on the wrong things because we all are we all fall short if you dig deep enough you're going to find where we all fall short <laughs> that's just the fact of it that where we live in a fallen world the prince of this world is satan he's he's the prince of this world we live in his world christ taught us to be in the world but not of the world and it, when we when we sit and look at the oh the, here's the checklist of here's a good person versus a bad person you're not getting to know people you're not getting to know individuals and you're blinding yourself to the to the virtues that others have you're blinding yourself to the things that others can bring into your life to make your life better and that takes it takes um it, it, there's a, there's a hubris there when you do that that is just it's it's it deteriorates your own integrity it deteriorates your own um sense of love sense of of, of charity I think that one of the things that we need to um, we need to do is encourage others to be good, regardless of what they're where they're at in life. Always be a and and, and I've noticed this when I've in some of my um, the, the communities I'm involved in online and stuff like that. There's a lot of Christian communities that it's good to just encourage people to be good, regardless of whether they're of the same faith or not, regardless of whether they're even if they're Christian or not encourage people to be good encourage goodness and that brings people to Christ that's that's what that's the, that's the thing about this life is that nobody who hears a honest testimony nobody who hears an honest someone who's doing good and, and honestly trying their hardest that 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 has goodness in them nobody can miss that you can't you can't ignore that because you can see it in those that are those around you if you just listen and look at how they're trying to be good, you'll see that. And it's not, like we said before, it's not our place to say whether somebody's trying hard enough or not. Because what may not look like monumental effort to you could be something that ever, could be all that that person has that they're putting into it. And there's a lot of things that go into trying to better yourself and be a better person. Um, and you know some things are easier for other people and others just aren't and then there's always there's always the psychological barriers that people carry with them from you know whatever they've experienced you know like I, I have my issues I have my vices and a lot of people may not think that I try very hard but and truthfully, I probably don't try as hard as I should, but <laughs> but I mean, it's nobody else's place. It's nobody else's business. And, you know, when we sit there and judge somebody for, you know, drinking or or smoking or, you know, stupid shit that you don't even have to talk to the bishop about and say, look how great I am, but you're in the back alley making backhanded deals, screwing people over on stuff and I mean, it's a two-way street, and none of us are perfect, but, I mean, let's not try to act like we are. Don't be what you're not. Don't pretend to be what you're not. 
here's the thing, and, and I had this conversation with a friend of mine recently. We, oftentimes we think of like... I'm your only friend. It was a different friend. <laughs> well, oftentimes we think of, of things being like, okay, if you do these things, then you'll, you're, you're going to go to heaven, or you're going to get reward, or whatever. Uh, we're on the good path. If you don't do these things, you're on the bad path. And like, <laughs> we think of it as like a, okay, again, check boxes. But when it's all said and done, it, the scriptures are clear that God cannot look upon any degree of sin with the, cannot look upon sin with the least degree of allowance. That means any sin that we possess disqualifies us from being worthy of him. Any sin. There was a story with um, Howard W. Hunter where he got physically sick. His, his spirit and his, and, his, and his body, towards the end of his life, um, but his spirit and his body were so in tune that he got physically sick for a few days. And he was asked, like, well, what, are you better now? Like, what, what was it? And, and his response when he was asked why he was sick was, I had an ill thought towards one of my brethren. And he, he, he had that thought, and that was, that was severe enough for him to become physically sick with himself, but also that's severe enough to, to disqualify us from the celestial kingdom. That's just any sin. People don't realize this. Any sin makes us un, unworthy. We are all unworthy. That, that's, that's, that should be very clear. None of us can, can rake it to heaven. You can't earn your way, way to heaven. That's, that's, um, that's very clear that our, our actions are important. But when, once we've done all that we've, we can do, the way Nephi said it, after we've, we've done everything that we can, then it is the grace of God that, is, that, that saves us. It is the grace of Christ. And He makes up for what we can accomplish, and none of us are ever going to be perfect. That will all be ill prepared to meet God. Yes. Regardless of who you are. That gap is going to look different for every person, but there's going to be a gap for every person. That's what I'm trying to get across. It's it's easy to be like, oh, this person does this, so they're they're a good person. This person does that, so they're a bad person. <laughs> but that's. But he does this on the one hand. It does that on the other hand. So, so they're a bad person. We always, There's, people will always enough, side on the side of, of your bad part. Well, if you dig enough, everybody's a bad person. Nephi himself said, oh, wretched man that I am. Nephi, you know the prophet, like the guy in the stories? He said, oh, wretched man that I am in Nephi 4. It, it was his lament. He said, oh, wretched man that I am. And that's Nephi. Yeah. If, if we're, if we're thinking ourselves above others, we've got, we're going to, we're in for a world of, of surprise. One of my favorite scriptures I've mentioned is is when Nephi he says that um, he prays the God of his all he prays that God see him with his all searching eye. He, I pray the God of my salvation that he view me with his all searching eye. He basically was praying that God sees who he is, sees everything, the good, the bad, everything. We need to realize God sees us whether we want it or not, and we need to open our hearts to Him. That broken heart and contrite spirit. That's how you do that. Is you open up to Him and you ask Him, what do I need to do? To, to gain my salvation, to to be converted. What do I need to do to follow you? And it's not it's not sufficient to just follow blindly with what's being told or if you go to church every Sunday that's good or you know it's important to do those little things. The, I'm not discrediting the little things. But those little things don't save you. It's Christ. He's the one who saves you. So get a relationship with him. Yeah. Amen. Do we want to go into the article? We probably should. Five and six. I think we should as well. Ugh. At least five, maybe six as well. Fire. I, I like that I have my oh. glasses on. Oh. Because <coughs> when the sun, when the when the smoke comes into my eyes, I just close my eyes and I can still talk and I just am just blind. <laughs> you don't have to have your eyes to talk. <laughs> <laughs> By joining the little things of life, that's that's no. Yes, <laughs> yes. No, find joy in the material things of life. <laughs> find find joy in your own glory. Get the head Woo! <laughs> <laughs> 
Man, you're a terrible person. <laughs> uh, so. Okay. Article 5, right? Yeah. Section 5. Uh, Article 1, Section 5. Each house shall be the judge of the elections, returns, and qualifications of its own members, and a majority of each shall con constitute a quorum to be to do business. But a small uh oh, can't see. Uh, do you want me to take it? But a small number uh. may adjourn from day to day. Yeah, you take it. And may be authorized to compel the attendance of absent members in such manner and under such penalties as each house may provide. Turn. Each house may determine the rules of its proceedings, punish its members for disorderly behavior, and with the concurrence of two-thirds, expel a member. Each house shall keep a journal of its proceedings and from time to time publish the same, ex ex <laughs> excepting <laughs> such parts as may in their judgment require secrecy and the yeas and nays of the members of their house on any question shall, at the desire of the fifth, one-fifth of those presents, be entered into the journal. Neither house during the session of Congress shall, without the consent of the other, adjourn for more than three days, nor to any other place than that in which the two houses shall be sitting. I, I can read. I think that's better. I think that's better. Did you finish that section? Yes. Let's. Um, things to point out there. I thought it was interesting how each house, so this is referring to the House of Representatives and the Senate, correct? Yes. Each House of Congress, and Congress is the House of Representatives and the Senate combined. So each house, so the Senate has the ability to dictate how they operate. The House of Representatives has the ability to dictate how they operate. Um, there's and, and they're two distinct bodies, and they can make the rules for themselves. And they can vote people. Did they, did they say that they can eject people in this one? Yeah. Okay. Sorry. But they can, with, they uh, can vote. With two thirds. With have a two, -thirds two thirds majority, they can vote to have someone removed from their position. There has to be. There doesn't have to be a trial or anything. It's just a straight vote. And they can also punish people for um, f for within their within their roles if they're not acting appropriately so they have that authority to kind of govern themselves and I think that that's an interesting thing an interesting dynamic somebody tried to get Nancy Pelosi ejected yeah. early, earlier this year I don't know what ever happened to all of it but I mean obviously it didn't happen you're not supposed to get set up the <laughs> <laughs> but you still sing that to me I'm just I'm the speaker of the house, and I got set up by a hairdresser. <laughs> I mean, I'm not making fun of hairdressers. I'm sure some of them are very smart, but I mean, what does that speak to you as the as a, <laughs> the well, third person in the line of secession to say I got set up by a hairdresser? Basically, <laughs> did she call you and set it up? Say, hey, Nancy, come on in. I'll do your hair. <laughs> Once again, rules for me, but not for thee. It's the decadence of the, the elite. That's, they're, that's, they're, their hubris is going to be their downfall. Because people, us normal people, will, will, <coughs> will only put up with it for so long. Mm -hmm. Well, they're going to try and cancel Thanksgiving. They're well, going to cancel it. I all but bet you they say, you can't do Thanksgiving. It's just, it's too dangerous. See, and that... They're trying to break up the family unit. Yeah. It's slowly. Quick. Slowly but surely they're trying to break up the family unit. And no nation, no country, any form of government cannot survive the destruction of the family unit. That was one of the one of the downfalls of Nazi Germany. Send the dads off to war, collect the the girls to go to uh, whatever the hell they sent the girls to do, I don't remember. And then send the boys to the Hitler Youth. So they break up the family unit. And that's one of the many things that led to their downfall. Yeah. But, I mean, if you don't have a strong family unit, then you can't, you can't endure. And they talked about that somewhere in this Lessons on Liberty. 
Well, I was just talking, I had this conversation with my kids this week, and they were talking about different kids who's... Hey, we got off topic. ...who are at school who come from broken households. And most of the kids at school come from parents who are divorced or split up. And it's just really sad to hear about. It's, it, it's, it's one of those things that the, the family has been attacked on so many different fronts. It's been attacked from a governmental front. The, the welfare state is trying to enable single families. There was, a, there was this lady that I saw, she was a, where she, she was given a, just a little YouTube clip, but she was talking about how she was a, always been a Republican or a Democrat growing up and stuff. And when she was with her husband and they were pregnant with their first, they, her husband lost her job and they basically had to go on welfare. And she went into the welfare office and the lady in there at the welfare office was like, well, are you married? And she's like, yeah, I'm married. We're expecting our first. And, and she's like, well, are you happily married? And this lady at the welfare office. And she's like, excuse me? She's like, are you, are you happy in your marriage? And she's like, yes, I'm abs I'm, I love my husband. Of course, I'm going to support him. And he supports me. And we love each other. And the lady at the welfare office said, well, if you weren't married on paper, you would get more money from welfare. And so she, she didn't think of it much, you know. But... She was like, she was. It, it was just a red flag that she remembered at a later time, but it was. It didn't. It didn't jog her out of her her own um, thoughts at that point. Well, later on, uh, later that year, she the, her husband got a job and he was doing well, and they didn't need the welfare anymore. And so she went in to get it canceled. And the lady's like, "What? Well, you don't have to prove that you you need the welfare for another eight months or six months or whatever." And, and she's like, I don't, I don't need it anymore, though. But I, I want to be off of this. It's for those who actually need it. And the lady's like, yeah, but you, you don't need to prove it yet. So you still have another six months to go on. So you could, in six months, it'll just fall off. The lady's like, no, that's not right. I don't want it. I, it's not for me. It's for those who need it. And the lady, the lady, she had to argue with the lady to cancel her welfare. And then the next month, it came again and she had to go down again and she had to go three different times three different months it continued to come after she had asked for it to be cancelled um, for it to finally get off and when, when they finally got her off the lady there is like I've been here at the welfare office for 30 years you're the first person that I've ever had that's cancelled it early and it's just like the, the, the welfare state is one of those things that is designed to break up our families and, and, and it was just like a it was an eye-opening thing to, to this girl who was who was telling the story, but I've, I've had family who have who've told me stories similar, where they, they canceled their welfare, and they just, they, they were, the lady's like, I'm sorry, and they're like, what? I'm, I'm in a better state financially, like my family's doing better because that, that's why I don't need it, and the lady's telling her, I'm sorry. It's like, no, that's not how it works. It's just one of those things that we gotta, we gotta be, understand what what is it that rules you? That's why it's important to be more self-sufficient as well. That's why but we got off topic. Now you're right. My eyes were closed. Are they still closed? No, I'm looking at you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to share a story. That's, that's why I like to mark these podcasts explicit. That's exactly why I mark these podcasts explicit. I never know when you're... You're a loose cannon. You never know when you're going off the rails. <laughs> I'm going to share a story real quick. Yeah, because we just got off topic. Shut up. <laughs> we were off topic. Now you want hey. to take us off topic again? Yeah, I'm going to take us even more off I'm topic. Sorry, and then we're going to go back to the Constitution. So it was like a year ago. And my daughter's... <laughs> I, was, I was in the truck with my daughter. And she says, Dad, I have a hole in my backpack. I said, no, you don't. Just giving her a hard time. I said, no, you don't. She says, yes, I do. So she puts a backpack over her head and she's looking through a hole. She says, hold up a finger. <laughs> so I held up a finger. <laughs> and then when, when my wife got home, she immediately told my wife and I was in trouble. <laughs> uh, anyway. <laughs> I love flipping people off. I also love to cuss. Where's that checkbox that says you're a bad person again? Oh, you can throw them all in there. <laughs> People ask me, what's wrong with you? All of it. <coughs> all of it. Um, do you, is the smoke still in your eyes? Yeah, uh, life goes on. My eyes are do closed. You, do you want me to read? You read, yes. 
I, I can't see a thing. My eyes are like watery. <laughs> Section six. I'm not crying. Okay? Shut up. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> I'm not crying. <laughs> Section six. The senators and representatives shall receive a compensation for their services to be ascertained by law and paid out of the treasury of the United States. They shall, in all cases, except treason, felony, and breach of the peace, be privileged from arrest during their attendance at the session of their respective houses, and in going to and returning from the same. And for any speech or debate in either house, they shall not be questioned in any other place. No senator or representative shall, during the time for which he was elected, be appointed to any civil office under the authority of the United States, which shall have been created, or the emoluments whereof shall have been increased during such time. And no person holding any office under the United States shall be a member of either house during his continuance in office. Are you, did you die? No, I was just thinking about it. I was thinking about how um, uh, it, it seems like one of the reasons why they have that last statement where you can't be in other, you, you can't hold other offices and stuff, is they're trying to um, prevent the accumulation of power into one body. Uh, the whole checks and balances you hear about since you're little, the checks and balances, there's something to that that you need to realize. And this is one more evidence of that is a uh, uh, congressman can't hold, um, appointed, uh, be appointed to an office that is outside of their, yeah. their purview, outside of their, but, uh, their elected role while they've been elected. And part of that is to avoid the accumulation of power. And the, my thinking is along these lines of like, why, why is the avoiding of the accumulation of power so important? It's because we as, as individuals, we as people, part of this world is, is worshiping false gods, is worshiping like idols. And that, that comes to hero worship. You, you gain someone who you, you love so much because of what they've done that you want to give them all the power and that takes away from your own freedom. They'll make the right choice. Yeah, and, and it's like, because you trust someone so explicitly, that yeah. you, you would be willing to let them in. Some people are good people, but eventually power always corrupts. Power always corrupts. And so that's one of those things that is so beautiful about our, our government is the whole changing of, of representatives. The, the balance whole, of power. Yeah, it, it, it's meant to keep power away from being coalesced into one body. And you look at like the, oh, exec, because of executive, uh, what is the... Um, executive actions, executive orders, yeah, no, authorities. What has what Governor done? Uh, who, her, 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 Hank done. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> um, um, uh, oh, shit, what is it called? A state of and, emergency. Uh, yeah. He's, he's declared a state of emergency for the last, what, uh, 130 year. days? <laughs> for the oh, last year it's almost. It's been like a year almost, yeah. Oh, we're in this... I have all this power. We're in this constant state of emergency. Unlimited he's, power. He's in a state of emergency to try to coalesce power around himself. He's, um, he, I was looking into the, the COVID response team, not elected officials. Um, yeah, the... By order of the governor and the the Utah State Health Department or whatever the hell it is. What? So now we have non-elected people yep. deciding what I can and can't do. Yep. And so no. It, it, people don't realize that, oh, it's the, they think of the government as one body. And it's not. And it's not meant to be one body. It's meant to be several bodies that check each other. Separate but equal. Separate but equal. There you go, Fred. I haven't stacked any on your side. <laughs> Thank you. I just throw it in there. My feet have been a little bit cold. That's why I'm putting them by the fire. Are you wearing wool socks? I'm wearing wool socks. Good job. But my boots are kind of thin. I was thinking of going and buying boots today. Maybe taking you to... to some uh, Danners. Buy, buy some Danners. Buy Danners. You said you wanted to... Oh, you probably can't. You probably can't walk. I can walk anywhere. 
Not very fast, mind you. <laughs> Have fun with life. I'm a cripple. It's funny. <laughs> to others. <laughs> Tease your friends, man. Don't get offended. Life was so much better when we just made fun of each other for our weaknesses and <laughs> shortcomings. Yeah. Like you. You're bald. <laughs> baldy. <laughs> baldy, baldy, baldy. Egbert. Egbert? Egbert. Scout camp. You forgot. I forgot. You go to hell. <laughs> you know how many scout camps we had were... Yeah, where we did, didn't do anything we were supposed to. We were terrible people. <laughs> uh, uh, so, <laughs> no, I get sidetracked because of you. And I have ADD, so it's not hard. We both have ADD. How do you make this work? You can add? No. That's what you just spelled. <laughs> Numbers are hard. My daughter, my wife says... So I'm, I'm going to give you a preview into the mind of Mitch. Well, at least uh, academic-wise. Hmm. I am terrible at math. Always have been. Never been any good at math. And my wife says, hey, will you help our, will you help our daughter with, uh, with her math? I'm like, uh, okay, what's she doing? She says long division. I said, nope. <laughs> my wife's like, what? I'm like, no, I don't know how. <laughs> my wife's like, are you serious? <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I learned it when I was a kid. I haven't used it since. Mm -hmm. So, no, I don't remember how to do it, and I don't particularly care to know how to do it. I mean, when it comes to math, I am legitimately retarded. <laughs> I mean, I, I am no good at math and numbers. I've never liked it. It just has always escaped my grasp. It's so funny, because, like, math is a pure abstraction. Like, it's... It if you could take the world and extract it away, that's that's where you get to math. Yeah, math math explains everything. No, that's what that's <laughs> what science teaches. Well, yeah, but that's, that's I, I, one of the things that one of my personal suspicions is that science has relied so much on math that they don't they, they don't they, rely they, on God. No, no, no. They they don't they they trust the math. You look at Fire. things like string theory and like quantum physics and stuff like that, and the, nope. they, they trust math so explicitly but yet they don't have any relation to life outside of the numbers. <laughs> and like, I think that there's truth in that. Yeah. But but it's kind of like, it's hubris to say, oh, I understand this because of the math. And it's like, mm, that's an explanation, but... <laughs> well, they always, uh, if you look at it, they always explain away, um, like the mysteries of the universe and everything. They're always using math to uh, prove that God doesn't exist, right? Try. And then I sit there and I say, did you ever think that maybe God's just really good at math, you know, with being all-knowing? <laughs> you look at things like the golden ratio, you know what that is? Is that where they're saying, like, for the balance of the universe to even work has such a, a small... Um, it, there might be something there, I don't think, nothing that, you want some? Yeah, my coffee's gone. See, my own vices. I love coffee, I love cussing, and I love Copenhagen. Let me get you some more. I'll, t I'll top you off. I'm good. Okay. That is very, that is very sweet. It's, it's, I like it a little sweeter than my wife. <laughs> I'm just kidding, it's really good. <laughs> <laughs> Don't make me laugh. I am a terrible person. Take pride in that. <laughs> what were we I am as God made me. I don't know. Oh, there's this thing called the golden ratio. Oh, yes. And it's, um, you look at, like, seashells, and you look at, like, all these different things in... in she sells seashells down yeah, by the seashore. in nature. So, like, the the way that it spirals, the percentage of how far it moves, the golden ratio is found there. It's found in a lot of financial, like, um, yes. when you look at different... Like, it's, it's just found all over. There's, there's other things that... There's these other sequences that are found all over in nature. And it's really... If, if you, um... If you would take time to look into that, you'd realize how much God is in the details. He really is. And it's just like, it's really fascinating. 
but yeah, people try to use that as like. People try to use that as a way to discredit God. Yeah. God is in the details. What else do you want to talk about? I've got two fresh logs on the fire. Um. I think I want to share a story. Of? A uh, dream I had once. It's a good story. There was a, uh, there was a time when I was... No. <laughs> Breaks. <laughs> Where's the <a> squirrel? <laughs> Why don't you want to start, share your story, Fred? Well, <coughs> it's it's very it's very personal. It's very. Oh, well, then don't share it. Okay. Do whatever you want. There was a time where um, I got my my youngest daughter. She's my third child. She's my youngest daughter. She was um, really young at the time, but she, though, though, there was one night I had a dream where we were, we were at our, uh, we weren't at our place, but we were at a place that we, I knew was home in the dream. And it was one of those dreams that you have that was so vivid that you'll never forget. And it's, and in the dream, Christ came. And he, he, um, he played with my daughter just a little bit, you know, like it was it was an interesting thing where he was jumping over the couch and she would run around and, and she was just a toddler at the time. And and he would jump over the other side when she and she would get scared and jump over the other side, like teasing her, you know, and they were just playing and he slipped on his rope and he fell on his on his bum. And, and she like went and gave him a big hug, you know, and and they were really they were really um just, just having fun in a in a in a very tender way. And then Christ got up and, and I gave him a hug and he, he he left and and I was or he went to leave and I was like Poitrate, which uh, in Romanian that it means like like old man or old brother, but it's also like a like old boy, like a like a this is surprising type of thing. Turn up events. Turn up events, yeah. And and he said to me, he's like I'm no expert, but I believe it's play and and I he, he corrected my accent, and it was one of those things where it wasn't like a, it wasn't like he was telling me, hey, you did this wrong. He was just showing me the right way to do it, and I think a lot of my attitudes towards commandments and towards the way that we live and the way that we do things have been influenced by, by this, this idea. And a lot of times we think of like the commandments as like, oh, ways that God tells us and puts us in our place and stuff like that. But I more view them as ways that he helps guide us to do what, to, to happiness. And I think that Christ is far more concerned with us becoming the best that we can be than he is about getting us in trouble. I don't think that that's what he cares about. I don't think he cares about us being um, in trouble and getting caught, and that's that's that Satan tries to perpetuate that idea of like, oh, you're you're a sinner, you're, you're going to be in trouble. That. Yeah, and we um, we really don't. It, it, it's it's counterproductive for us to, to treat each other that way of like, oh, you're you're in trouble, you're a bad person, you're good, you know. We really just are trying to get back to him. That's that's the purpose. Let's not forget that. Be the best you that you can be. <clears throat> you know, I always, and I don't know why, I always kind of remember as a child and being younger, thinking about about God and Christ being like stern. Um, you know, not, I don't know, you know, just stern, unwavering, which they are, yeah. but not in the way that we would typically think. They are still 
everything that they tell us to be be kind understanding um, they're far more charitable than yes. we are than the best of the, the people you know are they love us and they expect us to do the right thing but they also know that we're not always going to do that um, but you know I don't I don't look at a in that stern way of you know stop doing that get off of there don't do that more of a uh, I'm gonna let you climb up there and I'm gonna let you fall you know that'll hurt right I'm gonna let you stick a fork in the outlet <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna let you do that and then you'll learn your lesson I'm gonna pick you up yeah He's going to let you fall. He's going to let you do stupid stuff. <coughs> but he's not going to yell at you. Most of us. Some of us will earn that that butt chewing. Some of us are willingly choosing to, do, to go away from them. You won't do that. Yeah. It's, it's, for a long time we were able to say things like, oh, follow, you know, do good, be good, and, and politically that's understood what that means. But there's so much confusion in the, in the world today that I don't think that it's sufficient anymore. You have to tell people, communism is evil. <laughs> you have to tell people. It looks, on paper, it looks like it's all charitable and all kind and, and will take care of everybody. But, but it doesn't. It, it destroys. That's against everything that we stand for, and it destroys, um, you know, your motivation. It stifles creativity. It's the polar opposite of what this nation was founded on. Which would make sense why, why Satan wants so bad for this nation to fall, and it will come close. But in the end, it will it will win out because. Light always trumps darkness. In your political philosophies, look at the motivation, the core motivation. And if that core motivation comes down to envy, if it comes down to greed, if it comes down to um, pride, if it comes down to uh, just core, core vices, take note of that. If your core motivation comes down to duty, to justice, to love, kindness take note of that as well and when someone describes something to you realize that what they describe is their perspective on it and they might not even describe their whole perspective on it so you can't take anything at face value you can't believe the way that you can't believe a politician you can't believe a, a someone who who teaches about history to be 100 percent accurate because one they might just be mistaken but two they might be malicious. They might have the intent to tricking you into believing something that is not actually true or good. Tricking you into believing what they believe. Yeah. What's um, incorrect and immoral philosophies will always trick you into believing their way. Whereas honest, decent principles and philosophies... They'll resonate. They, you don't have to rely on trickery. You can just say, look, this is the way it's, it's got to be. And some people are so far gone that when it comes to talking about the Constitution and, and you know, the importance of Christ and God in, in, our, in our republic, um, they become so inundated with, with information otherwise that they're like, no, that's not true. But if you look at it, as we get older, as we gain life experience and you, and you look at it, so many people who are on one side on the on, you know on the one side will turn and come back to the other because they realize that it's right and the more that we spread our message of freedom and the importance of the constitution i believe the more people it's going to resonate with and the more people will come back not everybody but but the lines are being drawn and we have to decide and we have to decide which side of the line are we going to be on. For me, I'm going to be on the side of justice and freedom. I was born a free man, 
And by God, I'll die a free man. I will do everything in my power to ensure that that freedom and liberty and everything in these documents are passed down to my posterity because that's important. We're told all through the scriptures that that if we let it die, it's we're held just as accountable to that as the people who killed it. We cannot let it die. We have to pass it on to our posterity. And if we don't, they're, they're, we're setting them up for failure. We owe it to our posterity <coughs> to pass on something worth passing on. And uh, that's talked about all through the scriptures. It's talked about in, in the founding of our nation the importance of you know our posterity we don't just do what's what's best for us we do what's best for them we, and we haven't been doing that as a society for quite a while we plant the trees that our children will enjoy the seeds of uh, there's a saying and I don't I said it incorrectly but we, we, we plant the, the acorns that turn into trees our children will enjoy <coughs> Or something that effect and, and we, we live for those that, that come next we're not living for ourselves we're living for those that come after us our children our grandchildren if you're so caught up in your own life that you're not trying to live for your children's lives you're missing it if you're trying to get your children to to live your your glory days and trying to live through your children you're missing it you want to give your children a free life, a, free, a, a place where they can, they can find happiness, and they can build a life for their kids, they can build a life for their families, and they can, they can protect their wives, they can, they can feed their children. That's what you want for them. That's how, we, that's how we win this culture war, is by living, living good, living righteously, and getting those around us to do the same. I feel... Like I need to share this. Um, and if you remember from, if you've watched it or if you haven't watched it, from the first episode, I read George Washington's Vision for America. And at the very end of it, the angel says to George Washington, just, he says, Let every child of the Republic learn to live for his God, his land, and the Union. Let every child learn to live. Every child of the Republic. It's pretty powerful. And that's what we need to do. We need to live for the Republic, for the Union, for what's right. Yeah. As long as we do that and we and we do our best to be decent, honorable men and women, everything will work out. Our society, our form of government was meant for a moral people, and the founders said said that. They said our this system of government this republic is wholly inadequate for people who are immoral and that's why we're watching it fall the way that it is through our own pride thinking that we know better than the men that that God set up to found this nation thinking we know better thinking that it's an outdated thinking that our that our founding documents are outdated when they're not uh, the further we move away from the Constitution, the more we actually regress. <coughs> when someone says that they, they think the Constitution needs to be updated, they don't know, they don't know the Constitution. And they also 
you, you, you should have let that stand. That's the type of thing that should be an affront to your, uh, to, to you, if you understand the Constitution. That should be offensive to you. This is God's word. If you believe that it was inspired by God, if you believe that he sent, sent man at that time that he raised up specifically for that purpose, then you believe that this is God's word. You believe that it's scripture. Whether you've drawn that line and made that connection or not, that's, that's what you believe. This is his form of government. This is his this is his country. This is his land. And he set it aside for us. He sent us at this time. He has ensured that it would stand until this point for us. And he's relying on us to ensure that it not only survives but thrives the previous generations have let it got have let it get so far out of hand and so so far down the road opposite of where it's supposed to go that it's now up to us to right the ship there's and you got we got to be I want to be clear because we've been in bad places before. As a country, we've been in very bad places before. If you look at FDR, him, the things that he did where you were like, you were not allowed to own your own gold. He, gold was confiscated from people. The, the things that they did, just, just throughout different times, we've done some bad things as a country and we've been in bad places. Look at what we did to the Indians. Look at, exactly. Look at what we did to the Indians. <laughs> and there's a book called um, The Fourth Turning. He goes through different um, different times in this in this um, in our nation in our country's history, and he talks about their, how they we've had these different cycles. And the book was written back in 1997. I read it earlier this year, and it talks about how sometime between 2015 to 2022, there's going to be another turning of this cycle. And he, and he relates and and it was it, the book is is literally prophetic but it's it's don't the thing that i'm trying to get at is don't pride be cycle? discouraged the fourth turning what the pride cycle it's not the pride cycle in his description but it's it's related to it he actually he he identifies different um archetypes for the different generations and mm -hmm. he actually puts a name to different like there's there's four different archetypes and we rotate through those different archetypes and they one actually provokes the next generation to be a certain way provokes the next generation to be in a certain way and like the archetypes are there's one that's a the prophet archetype the hero archetype the nomad archetype and the um and the nomad artist archetype and they they rotate back and and because of the way that we we kind of have the way that we have gone through these cycles he, he, he goes. There, there are these two historians that they they did a fantastic job. It's really, really good book. But what I'm saying is, this right now is a pivotal time in our country's history where we have a choice, and if we choose poorly, our country will fall apart. If we choose well, our country will be made strong, and it'll it'll go through another great um, great turning. And it's just like, it, okay, we can fall apart right now. But if we choose well, and if we if we turn back to God, and if we turn to to good, and we turn to liberty, it's it's going to be it's going to the, the our our kids' generations are going to have the best time ever in the in the in our in the world's history, and it's something that we 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 are at this turning point right now. The book is um the uh, the fourth turning, and it's it, it was written in ninety seven, and it's just nineteen ninety seven, and it's just it's it's amazing. It's it's a really good book. It's on us. It's on us to change it. If you expect a corrupt, crooked, and broken government to fix itself, you're ignorant. You're ignorant. And you're waiting for what never will be. Uh, it's, it's, it's really. I love the saying that um, uh, a wicked servant is instructed in all things. It's a, I think it's from, I don't remember if it's in Doctrine and Covenants or 
uh, the Book of Mormon. It's in the scripture somewhere, but it basically says that a, a wicked servant is instructed in all things. And what that means is, if you have to be told everything to do, then you're not a, a righteous servant. You're a wicked servant. If you have to be told every little thing to do, you're not worthy of God. We need to be... We need to be sending people not only to the federal level of representation, but to the state, the county, the city levels. We need to be sending people there that are going to shake the status quo. We need to be sending people who are going to do the right thing. The people that don't have that don't have that desire to fit in, don't have the desire to play the game. That's who we need to be sending to represent us because they're going to shake everything up and we need we need to send the people that are going to let the establishment and the elites know that that they are the consequence of their actions that's who that's the type of person we need to be sending to represent us those belligerent defiant ones that are going to that are going to turn it back to the people and away from the elitists. You, the people who will not be corrupted by the, the fancy pants and lollipops of Congress. <laughs> fancy pants and lollipops. I dig that. It's awesome. But men who truly... Well, and women. People that truly value freedom and liberty <coughs> and God. people who are going to turn it back to the back to the Constitution and we see the arguments a lot lately about how um, about how everything is so expensive and how back in the 70s and in the early 80s and everything how people could afford to have a home and so many more things on a minimum wage and then they just they sit there and they blame it on the corporations and the businesses being greedy when in fact it's the government with their over regulations and their over taxation of private industry if you're in business you're in business to make money and so you're going to pass that on to the consumer whereas if it weren't for these excessive and oppressive regulation regulations and taxes we would still be thriving I think there's a lot of fingers in that pot because it's also part of the financial system the, 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 the debt economy that we have I mean there's 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 so many factors in this and like you said the government is one that it's it's is strangling small businesses and strangling individuals and it's buddy buddying up to two big corporations because it because of the, the financial benefit that individuals can gain from lobbyists. Exactly, <laughs> lobbyists. My fingers are cold. I don't have insulated gloves. No. I have a fire. I don't need your charity. <laughs> <laughs> so be seeking those those wise and good men to represent you. And be be good cheer. So much doom and gloom these days. I like dooming and glooming. That's a that's your that's it, it, it's it's mentally it's damaging. I think it is. When we're well, it's like in a state of panic or emergency or or stress. It, it, it mentally damages us in our ability to make good choices. Well, it's like it's like we were talking before we started before we started filming tonight, today, this morning. What you decide. <laughs> um, with everything that's going on, election-wise, and a change in administration, who knows what's going to happen? But I'm not worried. I'm not worried at all about what's going to happen. Um, I know a lot of people are, but 
I'm not. God is our captain. It's going to go exactly as he needs it to go, as he needs it to happen. You know, the Democrat, the, the, the Democratic Party may steal the election. It's kind of what I think they're doing. But, but that's a really kind of irrelevant to, to the point that I'm getting at. It's not irrelevant because, you know, but they may, they may steal the presidency, they may steal the Senate, so they have a supermajority, and that's bad. But nothing's going to happen that's not supposed to. There's... It will force us on the other side to be more vocal and more, I don't know, just the way that we need to be. Um, we, and we still need to remember that Congress needs a two-thirds majority to really pass anything, and they don't have that. So that's the, the way that the founders set up our, our system of government and the balance of power and everything is so brilliant. It's divinely inspired. Yeah. So they foresaw everything. So even if, if you have one party that gets a super majority, if they don't have like a super duper majority in the house, then it's, I mean, you have to have two thirds. When um, they were talking about, I remember the rhetoric about, oh, we control one half of one third of the government. <laughs> Do you remember that? One half of one third? <laughs> yeah. When the, I think Obama was in office and the Senate was the de uh, was Democratic and we had the House. Uh, we, had, we had a majority in the House um, in the Republican side. But, uh, Republican side, but it was like we control one third of one half of the one half of one third of the government. And it's like it, so much of it is trying to get people to be disheartened. It's like government really shouldn't be involved in your life that much. No, that's why it's supposed to be small. Yeah, it doesn't matter who's who's corrupt. If the corruption, if the government's small enough to where it can't impact your life. And right now, that's the fight. The fight is the people against the government, not the, the red versus blue. As and they'd have us believe. As they would have us believe. Well, that's where we were at the first of the year. Well, one and of look the, how they changed it. <laughs> one of the things that um, I was going to say, though, is this, this election cycle, regardless of what you think or regardless of what outcome ha comes of it, people are realizing how important it is to have a the vote itself is, is something sacred between us and God. And if we don't, if we can't rely on the vote, if we, if there's, if, if we live in a banana republic, the vote is our one single weapon that is peaceful. That's, that's, that's all I have to say. It's, it's, it's our one single weapon that's peaceful and it's, they're trying to take it from us, you know? Regardless of which side you, uh, you fall on it, half of the people believe that the other half is the, the, the one of the candidates is not legitimate. Yeah. And it's like, doesn't matter what what happens, the people are that that's that's in unrest is, is more alarming than anything. But again, election interference is a big deal, and it should be it should be investigated and it should be prosecuted to the fullest extent of the law. Because that's like, that's at our core. That's at the core of our, of our country is the right to choose who represents us. And so, I mean, to interfere with it's treason. What's, what's the, what's the penalty for treason? Nothing. Well, that, yeah. But that's, there's that's there's no there's no there's no penalty for treason anymore. They don't even charge anybody with it. The Obama administration left Americans to die in another country, and nobody was even charged with it. That's treason. <clears throat> Hillary Clinton sold a third of our uranium to Russia. That's treason. And what happened to any of these people? Nothing. They're not going to turn on themselves. It's just like everybody, well, there's a lot of people in Utah who are unhappy with Romney. 
and they were trying to introduce legislation to be able to recall senators because we don't do that in our state and it was shut down by Spencer Cox our governor elect douchebag elect I hope you're listening Spencer um, but that's just the thing they're not going to turn on one of their own because if they give that power back to us to recall a representative that means we can do it to any one of them and they're not going to turn on themselves because they're not representing us no they represent themselves regardless of which party they stand on and that's why I think we see a lot of the establishment Republicans not going into Trump's corner on the election fraud stuff maybe it changes the outcome of the election maybe it doesn't but there's evidence of voter fraud and it needs to be it needs to be investigated but (laughs) but the the establishment Republicans aren't going into Trump's corner because they want everything to go back to the way it was yeah that's their cushy jobs because Republican or Democrat it's about them yeah you take care of me I'll take care of you and I think a second Trump term would result in a lot of this corruption actually coming to light and a lot of people being prosecuted and they're not gonna have that but I said it's this is God's land and it will go how he needs it to go if it needs to be cleansed he's gonna cleanse it I think it's become obvious to anybody watching the news that the news is not on your side (laughs) if you if you get your information from the news then you need to find a better source well just like uh, even like KSL and Deseret News you can see the bias in church owned media nobody has your best interests in mind except for yourself and your God yeah there was there was so many things where like there was this lady that was supposed to go on Hannity and she worked for Dominion the the people that built the do you know who owns Dominion? Huh? Do you know who owns Dominion? It's not, you were talking to Warren, Warren Buffett? No. Who? Paul Pelosi. Oh. Because it's not Dominion Energy, it's... Um, yeah, the, the voting system. Yeah, Paul Pelosi? That sounds... Yeah. Is that uh, Nancy's husband? Yeah. Oh, God. There's that a conflict of interest That's there. exactly what oh. I said. <laughs> At least allegedly. At least allegedly. It's an owner, the owner or part owner or something, but... She was supposed to go on to Hannity, and then 30 minutes before she was scheduled to go on, she got canceled, and there was a... Um, came down, to, and Fox News came down, and they... All, all guests were not allowed to have people who were talking about voter, the electoral fraud and stuff like that. And it's just like, you don't... If you're... If you believe that the, the big... And the media is the propaganda wing of the Democratic Party. Yeah. Just like the Nazis controlled the media. Well, the elitists control our media. There's this guy, this guy named Yuri Bezmenov. He's done a lot of YouTube videos on Borat. Huh? No, he's not Borat. He, this guy's KGB, ex KGB. <laughs> he came to the United States and he did his videos are old. He did lectures in like the 80s, you know. And he's this old, he's this old um, ex KGB guy. He had to change his name, but he ran a radio. He, he, he did. He lived in Canada for a while, and he lived in the United States and stuff. And he, he taught lectures on how um, how the the KGB would um, how how Russia and just communism in general would, would spread and how they would destabilize co- uh, both, uh, different different organizations or different countries. And there was a list of like the education. The media, the politics, the um, churches, the, you know, and, and all these different things of, okay, and he went, he goes into how these different um, organizations are subverted, they're penetrated and subverted to be uh, an actor for the, the, the change of, of commun- uh, towards communism. And it's just like, it's, it's really interesting. You, we, a lot of times, we naturally want to give people the benefit of the doubt when it's something that, like, 
oh, that could have been just incompetence. But incompetence after incompetence after incompetence, there's there's a you can't just be foolish like that. There there are clear players that are that are designed to try and destroy our freedoms. Yeah. Yuri Besmanov. Yuri. Yuri Dude, that is such a Russian name. Yeah, he's such a, <laughs> such, he, he's, he, his lectures are so good. I, I'd encourage anybody to look them up. Yeah. Sorry. Four? Well, I'm not really sorry. I don't think that was a proper You want any more fire? What? Do you want any more fire? Yeah. Are you done? You want to go more? I don't know. How long have we been doing this? I don't know. You want me to check? Yeah. We could pause it for a minute so I could go pee. Yeah, at I least. <laughs> Uh-oh. Low power. Uh-oh. All right. After our party break. <laughs> We've decided... That today is a day. The, d the day is young. It is a day. And we're going to be done. Yep. <laughs> Do we say, like... Um, your emergency preparedness tip for the week. It's Learn how to fire. Shut up. Learn how to fire. Learn how to fire. Because <laughs> so, I, oh, I am idea. a master. That was a good idea. I am a master fire maker. Um, no. But, uh... That is a good point, though. Learn how to, learn how to fire. Um, the point that I was going to make is, obviously, there's snow on the ground. It's getting cold. It's getting to be winter time. Make sure that you have emergency stuff in your vehicle that in case you get stranded or whatever, you can, you know, not die. Have some old blankets in your vehicle. Have, uh, you know, have some some kind of food and a way to heat that food um that way you don't die it's kind of important so i keep <laughs> and fred's always amazed because of all the shit that i keep pulling out of my toolbox i'm fairly convinced <laughs> that you just forget where to like you just i keep stuff in there that i need i think you open it up and be like what is in here that i can figure out i know oh. exactly what's in there <laughs> you know all the things that are in there? I got a pretty good idea. <laughs> what about your back seat? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <coughs> I don't know what's back there. It's kids' land. Yeah, it is kids' land. I need to clean it out, but. It really is a good point because, like, you think, oh, I'm just running to the store, I'm running to my friends, you throw on some slippers, and you drive. And if you get if your car gets stuck in the snow and you don't have actual shoes on and stuff like that, you're in a world of hurt. That sucks. Yeah. Try walking a mile or two back home or worst case scenario, you're stranded for a couple days because nobody saw you slide off the road or it's that bad. Um but I keep I keep a shovel in my truck unless somebody took it out. <laughs> But I've got one of those little army shovels in my toolbox, and I've got axes, and you know, I have ways to start fire, I've got ways to warm up food. And I have food in there, obviously. <laughs> I keep but, all my food storage inside. <laughs> have have some, have at least some blankets and some food and stuff in your vehicle. Yeah. In a way, like I said, in a way to heat that food up. As far as blankets go, wool blankets. Ow! <laughs> it's gotta hurt, dog. Was he scratching her back on purpose? I don't know. <laughs> it takes a minimal effort, and it, it can have a huge impact on when you actually need it. Your MREs have little yep. heaters in them, but you have to have water for it. So if your water's frozen, that does you no good. I've got a little, I don't know, a little butane stove thing. That I can use. Ooh. What do you have? I've You're gonna die. 
I'm an inside player. <laughs> that's why you're so amazed by and blown away by everything that's in my toolbox. I was just thinking about that as I was driving over. I was like, you know, I really just don't go out enough to realize that. Like, I would, I, I think that. You have an axe? You have two axes in your truck. No, I was so amazed by that. <laughs> I was super happy. My hammer disappeared, though. <laughs> <laughs> so I haven't put it, found it and put it back. But I'm just a, I'm a homebody. I like to be at home and do stuff at home. I like to be outside. I like to go camping. I like to spend time in the woods. But that was uh, this week's preparedness tip. Have your emergency stuff in your vehicle. This has been episode 11. Thank you for watching. I think our heads are cut off. Probably. I don't know. That's their problem. I know what I look like. They're not missing anything. Like I said before, I have not the face for TV or the voice for radio, so I'm really screwed. <laughs> but, yes, be of good courage. Fear not. The Lord will provide. Do your best, and the good Lord will do the rest. That's all you need to know. Yeah. Episode 11. Until next week. Until next week. Love is rising. Say rock the party, bitch. Nope. It's the gayest thing I've ever heard. Let me tell you about one of my favorite things. It's called peer pressure. This video is about peer pressure. You want to be cool, don't you? You want to be awesome super super rad and any other word synonymous with cool go ahead and like this video share it with your friends because if not you will be less than cool <laughs>